this time and i'm usually the dude that's just blabbing off so it's kind of it'll be a little different no it's killer man i think we should come up with like a, a panel show and take it on the road you know we've done it a few times we do it well that's what i want you guys Travel to do with up. me traveling uh, panel. all right so by the way we're live <laughs> so uh welcome everyone let me uh pop out the chat so i can uh see what's going on but uh anyway that's what we're talking about uh we're gonna have some extra guests uh hopefully popping in and uh in and out but i'm gonna pass the mic off to mojave so mojave uh take it away yeah hey thanks for having me here peter um yeah i guess the main reason i wanted to come and talk today was i recently did a breeder's brief for um cannabis business times uh, on sour diesel. And, um, you know, it's been, it's been a topic of interest in my years in the business, um, where people just are perplexed by these, these, uh, origin tales with various varieties, you know, um, and probably there's no more, there's not a, a more contentious, you know, uh, relationship around the origins of sour diesel, you know, maybe OG, Kush could compete with that, but the Kim Dog you know. story, the OG Kush, all th those those three especially just have. Uh, there, there's a lot of truth, and there's a lot of other stories that have just somehow come into fruition over the years as well. And it's like, uh, yeah, I've heard some really crazy ones for sure. Yeah, you know, I mean, <clears throat> and and the thing is that everyone. When, uh, when a cultivar has been around for as long as these have, everyone has their version because they've had a relationship with it for so long that, you know, they've been, you know, you, you'll hear all over the internet guys are saying, like, this is why it's called ocean grown. It's because, you know, back yeah. in 2001, I've been doing this for 19 years. You know, it's like, all right, we'll take it back. What about 1996? What about 1992? What about 1989? You know, how far does your your story go back to where you can give it credibility. Well, and these varieties are such game changers in the industry. It, you know, it, as far as cannabis history, they changed the game on so many levels that of course there's going to be this mystique and this mystery behind them. And I think there was a lot of people, we didn't want to give our strains out back then. It wasn't like we were sharing cultivars with people we didn't know. You really had to know somebody to get them and, or, or steal them from people. You know, there's been crazy stories about that. And so everything, because, you know, because it was also illegal, there was like, a, you know, it was a whole different world back then. Yeah, totally. And careers have been made off of that. I mean, it, you, you see specifically OG, you know, people who got OG in their hands early and were able to capitalize off that and were really able to build a career either as a, a, a flower brand or as a breeder or whatever. It was like getting that backbone to your, your genetic library was was critical and yeah and, and and sour was the same way and from the beginning there was always um kind of this tension around that you know um and i met these guys in amsterdam in i think it was late 93 early 94 might have even been before they developed sour i'm not really sure i, I i'd be stoked if they could someone could jump online and validate that but um but I met him in Amsterdam and when, you know, they brought over a little sample of sour diesel, it was like, I was like, whoa, wait a second. You know, we're, we're in a sea of, of skunk one and Northern lights and haze crosses and sour was definitely something different. You know, they, they had, they, they grabbed something really special and, and um, they ended up moving to Amsterdam at one point and, you know, I helped them put together one of their grows over there and and we became really good friends and um that was before it was a big international you know story and very few people had the plant and they were just a couple, couple of young guys from new york and it was their story so there was no reason for them there was no utility in them making up this origin myth at the time it hadn't really gone viral you know so that, that was my relationship with them. And that's how I knew that, you know, the sour diesel version that I came to understand goes back to around 94 or so. Um, and I think that that kind of 
correlates with Kim Dog's version of, of when he gave out Kim to a couple of other people and how that eventually would become sour. So I think that there's some consensus out there that this is the actual true story. Yeah. Um, and anyway, so I guess, so as with most modern varieties, they generally come from fag seed and the, the kind of the origin mythology behind that is, is always difficult to tell because you know, you're always going back, well, what, what, what made that bag seed? What made that bag seed? How far back can you go? But um, in terms of how sour diesel was um, developed, it's a really simple story. It's, it's Kim Dog flour. And Kim Dog gave, gave um, cuttings to a grower in, in, um, in New York, the weasel, weasel with the diesel. And um, flour, a uh, couple guys, Maxwell and Almanzo, they got flour from uh, from that that Kim Dog batch, and then they developed, they they grew out their variety of Kim, which was you know, and then they had a, a buddy of mine who's on Instagram as Sour Silicate. He got some flour from those two, their grow, and out of that came some seeds, and those were what generated, um, what started sour diesel. So it's really simple. Um, there's not a lot of mystery behind that. But I guess the, the biggest thing that's always gonna last on is like, who is the male, who is the pollen donor? Where yeah. did that come from? And there's all, I mean, there's, it's, it's like the mass super skunk, it's this, it's blah, blah, blah. Um, but I don't think anyone really knows. And I don't think anyone will ever be able to know because all those grows have multiple varieties grown in the same room, you know, so. Yeah, and there's no, I mean, as far as DNA and, and being able to test stuff, there's those strains are all long gone as far as what they probably had in there. The mass super skunk that was used, I mean, since he lost all their seed stock. Um, so it's not like we can just pop some of those and see if, oh, maybe that's in there. Yeah. Um, you know, it'd be nice. I wish, you know, technology came earlier on so we could have some more of this genealogy because there's just so much confusion on what stuff actually is out there. Absolutely. And, and um, as far as I know, I think the, 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 one of the reasons why Super Skunk was a candidate um, was when they were flipping through the Cincy Seeds um, seed bank catalog. If you look at Super Skunk, it does have a little bit of a sour diesel look to it. It's got that little the, the bracts kind of make these little nodes, looks like little. It a hundred percent looks like it. Yeah, yeah. it's the, the way the, the calyx stack, it a hundred percent looks like it. Matt Riot just actually posted a picture of the, uh, of the actual Sensi catalog with the picture in there. And it's like, yeah, totally. It totally looks like it, but looks don't mean that that's it. You know, it's like, there's so many things that look the same. Yeah, totally, totally. And the chances are that it does, I mean, so many varieties have common parents and there's so many yeah. recessive traits that it's really hard to know, you know. Um, I mean, we know it came from Kim and we know Kim yeah. came from this dog bud, this, this uh, white whale called dog bud that was coming out of NorCal. Um, and so, what? And, and the big question is what's dog bud, right? You're always gonna go back, let's go back one further. And I do feel that that there was a considerable amount of really good high-end um, flour being produced in Northern California, even indoor towards the late 80s, that wasn't Dutch, you know, but there, we did have non-Dutch stuff. I mean, that's where skunk came from California and made it to Holland. And then a couple of years later, because seeds were being distributed from the Netherlands, then all of a sudden everything was had skunk one in it. You know, but then there was also the heritage stuff from California that was predates the Dutch version of skunk one, you know, and that goes, that goes with all the lines, all the Northern light crosses, everything. So we don't really know what dog bite is. And I think that there's, there's uh, a possibility that there's a common parent between Kim Diesel and even OG Kush. I mean, it, it's, it's very possible um, yeah. that, that what they call the Emerald Triangle, which is what was the one of the parents for OG was that dog butt or a similar line. Remember in the in the 80s, everyone grew from seed. 
So the, if you had a, a variety, you didn't have an identical clone. So it was really, did you have some dog bud genetics in there? Or was Emerald Triangle and dog bud from the same lineage? Was it the same grower? Was it, who knows? I mean, things were just passed around. Yeah. Um, but there's definitely something there. I mean, those, those are the gassy varieties. That's what brought us that gas, you know, that yeah. we're working with now. Game changing gas. You know, and mind changing too. I mean, you know, I think if you would have told people in the early 90s that gas was going to be cool and gas was going to be the hit, people would have looked at you crazy like, who wants gas or fuel? And it's like, right. all the modern day genetics are based on fuel. Like, it's, it's really, uh, you know, it changed because of those varieties, especially those three the OG, the sour, and OG sour diesel and what's the like even like TK and those those varieties with gas. I mean, there was the HK, the uh Henry Kissinger, which was the that was a Kush. Mm -hmm. uh, that was that was insane too. That was another one that had like some gassy funky fuel. But before that, I didn't really see, you know, I started smoking in 91 and we didn't see we had cat piss and we had haze like some of the real pungent haze varieties and those were those were uh, amazing in their own you know skunk number one so we have we have skunk we had skunk but we got in santa cruz and that was totally amazing but those were such game changers in the way people even looked at herb and the way breeding changed you know from which is about what 30 years ago now 29 years ago since i started smoking and it's like everything has gas in it now Right. Everything does. Yep. And it's interesting because where did that gas come from? You know, that fuely terp profile isn't, it's not one terp, it's a profile. It's a combination of yeah. that resiny kind of herbaceous resiny um, myrcene quality. And then that kind of solventy limonene lemon pledge kind of smell that, right. that combined makes this gas on their own. They don't when it's limonene dominant and there's not very much myrcene in there and in fact the same way it doesn't really come up it's that perfect marriage that perfect balance yeah and it's interesting because i talked to um origins tk about um the original um og cross and yeah. it 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 turns out that it was a um a hindu kush male or a hermed hindu kush that they brought from that they got from neville seed bank in like late 80s and that Hindu Kush hermed and it pollinated their, um, their triangle, uh, emerald triangle cut that they had, which was the Northern Cal cut. Yeah. And the first question I had was like, cause I know Hindu Kush, you know, it, it's, it has its Afghani kind of resiny profile, but it doesn't have yeah. that big bouquet. It's not that big push in your face. No, and, but it had that nose burn to it for sure, where it'd burn your nose cause it was so strong. Totally. That's what the Henry Kissinger was, was actually a Hindu Kush. Oh, sweet. Interesting. Yeah. HK. Yeah. HK. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's cool. So wild. Um, but what, what, what uh, origins TK? And I asked him, I said, well, who, where did the, on OG, what contributed more of the aroma profile? Was it the Emerald Triangle cut or was it the Hindu Kush? And he was like, it was definitely the Emerald Triangle. So that NorCal cut was brought, what brought that bigger, kind of complex bouquet that we associate with Kush. I um, mean, obviously the, the, the Hindu Kush is just a, a resiny, um, incredibly, you know, um, drippy plant. So it definitely, it took whatever NorCal thing they had and kicked up, kicked up the octane a little bit more. Right. And that's interesting, I think, because when, when I, when I came back to Cali, when I moved back um, from Amsterdam in, in 99, and I uh, reconnected with one of the um, uh, sour diesel bros. He, first time he smelled OG Kush, he's like, dude, that's diesel. It's like, that's, that's that diesel, man. Where'd you get this? He's like, I've seen this in New York. And I was like, kind of like, well, I don't know, man. He's, you know, New York, <laughs> Florida. Yeah, sure. You know, East Coast, whatever. Um, and so there, right away, there was, and this is when hardly anybody had seen OG at that point. And so the fact that this guy just comes across the country, sits in my apartment, smells it and goes, dude, that's related. You know, 
to me, that doesn't say for sure that the lineage is there, but it does, it definitely hints that there's a common ancestor there for someone just to have that big of a like, oh, you know? Yeah. So I do think that there's some kind of relationship between those three plants and, and, and that, that to me was telling. Yeah, you know how how did we get how did we get uh, from oh how did we get from dog bud to Kim to sour is pretty clear, you know, yes. and how we got to OG is a little bit less clear, um, but and whether their relationship is there, whether it came down from New York or or you know East Coast down to Florida, um, but the but the guys in in Florida were definitely like, hey, we got this cut in NorCal and we made this accidental cross, and that's where it came from. That's where TK and OG came from. So that story is also, I think, solid. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And um, anyway, so um, I was hoping that some uh, some that we could get a little confirmation on some of these 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 facts that we now are kind of like massaging out, but. Um, but to me, that's the that's the crux of it. That there's that there's no reason why anyone would make up a story, and there's that there's no reason why not to believe that it's just a simple version, a bag seed version of Kim Dog. Yeah, and you know, in in my experience, so so we got the cuts in the late '90s of Sour Diesel, and also we got a cut called the Dog, D A W G, not to be confused with. The real chem dog, which is DOG, there's been a lot of argument. And I'm sure as chem dog, it's like it was never DAWG, but we were handed a, a cut and they came from Oregon. So my partner Luke and I had gotten the, I had gotten them from him and he had gotten them from Oregon along with the Trinity and mm -hmm. the Four Way and a lot of these real popular snow you know, varieties. The the snow, snow. Yeah, snow yeah. caps, the yeah. snow. We had the corn, that was another one that came down from there. And uh, so we had these varieties from Oregon. Well, the dog and the sour, and I believe we, we now believe that the dog is a bag seed from the chem dog. Well, they grow identical. So this, you won't, you won't be able to tell until the actually calyx start to stack because the sour diesel goes conical and the dog stays flat, right? Mm -hmm. And so the dog actually has the terpene profile of chem dog of like the 91, very similar. Whereas the sour has more of a lemon sweetness along with the fuel. And uh, there's no real sour in the smell. That's, you know, I think that's probably another good part of the story to share that uh, it just made people sour. It, yeah, it to... well, there's, there's a, that's, that's it. And, and uh, real quick, Peter, um, sour silicate's trying to get in the Zoom. He says his Zoom link's not working. And he, he was wanted to call in. Do you have a number for him to call in? Let 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 me troubleshoot that with him, and you guys keep going. Awesome. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. You know. Well, the the way I remember the story is is you know Kim was all the rage. Everyone knew Kim was was the shit. And yeah. when when sour silicate um, got some buds, or they they put it in a little film container and they labeled it our Kim. And that was our Kim. And then at some point, someone put a little S in front of <laughs> our, and right. it became sour Kim. And and he'll tell you, I think, that he definitely, that there was a flavor component to it. But more and more over time, what sour came to mean was how relationships were soured and yeah. how it, it brought out greed in people. And this plant became this coveted thing and because of that, it brought out a lot of negative energy and, and people who wanted to capitalize and, and you know, and that, that I think was part of the reason why the mythology just kept going and going about where it came from is because at that moment, it did get sour. And, right. you know, and also at that moment, you know, when, when young kids all of a sudden have something of that value that, you know, it becomes this, this kind of weird pressure. It's like almost like uh, like uh, from Lord of the Rings. Schmeagle. Yeah, Schmeagle exactly. <laughs> the fucking ah, the ring, you know. And and there was definitely that. I mean, when when they came over to Amsterdam, there was definitely some people who were showing some interest. Like, whoa, what is this that you have here? 
what yeah. do you got? You know, because it was different. And that brings out a lot of negative energy. And the same thing with OG, that same thing happened where it's like, if you could get it, you, uh, you had it and then people wanted it, you know, and people would pay money for cuts and people would make deals and people would steal cuts or take them. People would call the cops on other people so they get raided so that they could steal their cuts and their business. Totally. I mean, it's just, yeah, and not just sour diesel, but just in strains in general, people get weird when it comes to money and, and greed and ego. The plant, yeah. you know, is powerful enough to do crazy stuff too. It's like, well, think about it. You know, I, I, I work with a company now called Breeders Best and what we do is, is plant IP, right? Yeah. And think about sour diesel. Think about all the money generated from that plant over the yeah. years. I mean, we're, we're probably talking in the bees. In the billions. The billions. Yeah. yeah, I would say it's in the billions. I think and so. And, and, and I think that, you know, not that, not that, you know, I'm not saying someone should have hoarded genetics and not given out. I think it's great that people share genetics back in the day. And that's why we have all the diversity we have today. But the reality is somewhere inside, people acknowledge that there's that inherent value. And I yeah. had that same experience to, to some degree with Sage in Amsterdam. You know, where like all of a sudden you got something new or a better version or a more productive version. And people all of a sudden are like, hey, I'll, 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 let me get a cut. And they start offering you money. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's challenging. Um, yeah. And, and even if they can't get a cut, they'll knock you off and say they have it and they've bred into it. I mean, there's a lot of seed companies that have sold sour, sour diesel, including myself, where we did use the real sour to make the seeds, but. I, I feel looking back as it was a big mistake coming from a seed company to call something sour. I call it AJ sour, which is funny because I apologize to AJ, which we can go into that a little bit later. But uh, um, yeah, so in, in around 2012, we released AJ sour diesel seeds and I thought they were a good representation of AJ sour diesel or what I thought to be AJ sour diesel at the time. The truth is, is sour diesel is meant to be a clone only strain uh, OG Kush is meant to be a clonal. Those are clone only. It's like you, you cannot replicate those in seeds. And even on my Instagram post, there was someone saying that they had sour diesel seeds. Well, the, the thing is, is I've worked with sour a lot, even breeding, uh, you know, with pollen using it, it doesn't self well. It has herm traits. Basically you have, uh, those, those genes on both sides so that when you self it, it causes intersexual traits. So it's, it's a huge problem with that. And, you know, I have people coming up on my post saying I have cat piss seeds, all these things all the time. And it's like, well, you have seeds maybe made from cat piss, but if you were to market those, you should probably call them something else. And I think that was one of the biggest mistakes in Amsterdam is they wanted to basically have everything available in seed form, even though it wasn't the same thing. Right. Big time. Yeah, that's, um, that's it. it uh, you know, like when we're talking about the lineage, um, it always comes back to who's your daddy, right? Yeah. And that's the case with a lot with a lot of cannabis varieties because there was very few true breeding males that were used for a lot of the Dutch stuff. So there's a common, often a common um, parent. Um, right, white sour, widow. <laughs> yeah, thank you, exactly. But um, with with sour, we know it it it's it tend it has an intersex tendency. So it's always been like we don't know what the pollen donor was, but we do know sour diesel always puts off its own male flower. Mm -hmm. So there's a high likelihood that sour diesel could just be Kim times Kim. Yeah, and that would be my yeah, honest guess is that it's Kim times Kim, mm -hmm. just because that dog bud is so identical. But you know, it's like, and I have experience from growing those side by side. And it's like, there's no doubt that those are almost the identical genetics. You know what I mean? They, they look like brothers or sisters not brothers but they look like sisters and uh you know i i would guess that that's the case but we'll we'll never know and it really you know it doesn't matter it's a great topic to talk about but uh you know these genetics have come so far and they're bred into so many things it's just if you look at the lineage i mean i think i read something maybe three or four years ago that said chem dog was in like a 90 plus percent of all the things tested yeah so you know and it's like it makes perfect sense absolutely because everybody wants that that gem that's right and then if you get into um headband 
Yeah. When we start throwing <laughs> that into the mix, then you start realizing like, wow, everything really is based from this lineage. Yeah. Um, so let me actually, I'll, I'll, I'll lead into that story. Um, I think that that's a uh, kind of speaks to the whole rename game and the, and the shuffle. And um, when I was, um, when I moved back from Amsterdam and I lost contact with the sour guys completely. And they had kind of dispersed and moved to different states. And so sour diesel was kind of gone in some sense, you know, or at least not, not where it was before. And um, I had, at the time, I had a girlfriend in, um, in um, Big Sur, California. And I was doing a lot of um, water hash production back in the day, you know, going up to uh, the farms and showing people how to make use of their refuse that they were just throwing in the trash back in the day, which was like a crime. And so I used to make um, some pretty tasty hash. And I used to do that in Amsterdam as well. I was kind of, that was one of the things that I was big into was making full melt back when there wasn't a lot around. Totally. Pre-bubble bag or was there actual bubble bags? In it? They, well, actually the funny thing is I did do it pre-bubble bag. I made my own little thing, but it was based off of, um, it was based off of um, Reinhardt's machine. Or whatever yeah we had silk screens with red solo cups that was like the original bubble hash back in the day and we used five gallon buckets to whip it well let me show you i'll show actually where's my my device i have a device that i came up with um i thought i had it in here maybe i put it somewhere else i had a device a little shaker container that actually would go on to some guy ripped it off and they, they called it the the hash maker kind of i don't know where i put that thing i was guess i was cleaning it out um, and the, that device was what, one of the things that I used to use, but I mostly did flat screen, you know, just very careful yeah. meticulous flat screening. But the hash maker was actually really handy. Some guy, I had showed it uh, around and some guy ripped it off and he made this little mini hash shaker thing. And they still sell yeah. it today, the little, with the little red cap. And he did it upside down and put the screen, wrong size screen in the wrong place. And it was like kind of a bummer. You know, at the time I was trying to come up with my own hash making ideas, little tins and little hash shakers. So that was my thing anyway. And and that was one of the things that I did with the sour crews and we'd, we'd make hash together. I'd show them how to make hash. And anyway, I, I go back, I'm living in Cali and my girlfriend at the time was going to school in Vermont and to college. And she brought a, a, a chunk of water hash that I had made for her and she was smoking it in a circle. And Someone in that circle is like, whoa, I haven't seen full melt like that in like a while since like back in back in Amsterdam, this guy named Mo. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's my boyfriend. And in and, and that that guy, I can't remember who that was. I think it might have been Almanzo. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, he reconnected me with with Sour Silicate, who's the original guy who popped the bean. And that was a weird connection, right? And then all of a sudden we're like back in it and they're up in, in, in um, Mendocino, glass blowing and growing. And I got back into, you know, we started hanging out again. So I'd go up there and hang out. And at the time I was developing some new varieties for the medical market here in California. And, um, and anyway, so when, when I got connected with, with those guys again, I was also hanging out a, a bunch with um, the OG crew. You know, Josh D is an old friend I've known since right. since before I moved back to, to Cali, actually. Um, maybe 98, 97, 98. And um, anyway, so I kind of said like, hey, you guys, you should try this sour diesel stuff. They would kind of heard about it, but never seen it. It really just wasn't on the West Coast at all. And the same with the OG, you know, the OG was a West Coast only, Sour Diesel was East Coast only. They were like the two, it was like, it's like Biggie and Tupac, yeah. you know, like the right. Coast Wars. And, um, but anyway, I was able to broker an exchange of cuttings between those two groups, basically just saying, hey, you know, you guys, are you willing to try this? And will you share a cutting? Which wasn't easy back in the day because of the, shit we talked about earlier it was people coveted their varieties and held on to them really really tight um so anyway i made that exchange got them 
clones. But when I did that, I, I said, because there was a lot of negativity sometimes associated with, with the greed around these plants, I suggested that they don't call OG Kush, OG Kush. <laughs> Come up with a different name just because I don't want to tie you in with this other thing. You know, it's, it's, there's a lot of competition. There's a, there was people were getting busted and OG people had- People sending own. snakes to people's houses, all kinds of shit. Dude, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and that Turk profile is so, it's like a, it's like a, a scarlet letter in some kind of way, you know, it's like, it, it, it tells you like, okay, so you got this cut and you know this person, that means you're connected to this person, you know, and I thought it would be best if they didn't do that. And so they decided to rename it Headband. Yeah. So OG Kush, all of a sudden, boom, became Headband. Yeah, and our guys got the, I mean, we had OG, we had other OGs, but we got the Headband back in the day that was what we won a cup with and the guy who gave it to us told us it was sour yeast is noel from nectar's collective great guy uh had told us that it was sour diesel times og kush but really it was og kush which he got from la named headband we uh, entered a cup in 2013 and won first place high times with headband but really it's a uh, you know the classic og kush is what it was right so it was just og Yep. Just good old OG. Good Some old of the OG. best stuff out there. Yep, exactly. And, you know, and and back in the day, everyone, no one, had, we didn't have the access to knowledge that we have. So everyone's grow was kind of like a hodgepodge of what they thought a good grow should look like. And so all the bud did always come out very different. There wasn't yeah. like this, you know, it's always going to be the same the way we can do it now where we all collectively share information and know what type, what type of nutrients to use, what type of lights, what type of blah, blah, blah. So it was always hard to tell, like, is this exactly the same or is just this your version of it, you know? For sure. But with sour, with the, the thing is because, because it, um, interesting, he just, he, I just got a, a text. He says he gave it to Noel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like, <laughs> I, he's, like, I, he's like, yeah, I gave it to Noel. Um, <laughs> and um, anyway, but with sour, you've got, you've got, um, Sour Diesel and OG Kush being grown in the same grow room and being sold as headband. Sometimes Sour was headband, sometimes OG was headband. And then, you know, you've got beans coming out because Sour always throws off male flowers. Yeah. And then you got people popping beans from those flowers that they're calling headband. So at, at some point you actually started seeing plants that were a cross of Sour and OG sure. labeled headband. Yeah, I mean, even DNA, they made a real sour times OG that I feel like was a, yeah, that, that not necessarily a headband, but that was an OG sour. There's been a bunch of headbands that are definitely somewhere in the middle of OG Kush and Sour Diesel, but the real one that I know is an OG Kush. Right. Yeah, you know, that, that's my experience with it. And there's other people with different experiences for sure that'll say, oh no, man, the one that was from Mendo, bro, that one, that one was definitely more sour than OG, but it had more gas than sour. And it's like, and, and that story is true to them, you know? Right. And, and it's, a, and it's, a, it, it, it's go, also goes back to who grow it and how, how you grew it and whether it was indoors or outdoors and, and all the above. And yeah. Yeah. Totally. So, yeah. So, so it's a rename game. It's the classic rename, the reshuffle, the, you know, the coveted clone only it's all, all those stories are tied up into that, that little relationship. And, there was a headband. I mean, I do believe that at one point they weren't just saying that, you know, it's a descriptive of the high, you know, when you get a high and you get that tight scalp feeling and it feels like a rubber band yeah. going up your head. But I, I'm pretty sure at some point there was a variety back in the day that was at least being sold as headband. So there is some mm -hmm. heritage behind the name yeah. that I think what happened is that those, those varieties or, or that cannabis kind of fell off to the wayside. And then when, OG came up as the new headband, it kind of took the narrative that was developed and all of a sudden it's like, oh no, headband goes way back to East Coast as long as Kim and Sour D. So, right. so now we've got like another group of people who are like, I remember headband, it's not OG. <laughs> yeah, I got seeds of it. <laughs> I got seeds of it, I can prove it, you know. Totally yeah. wild. 
you know, but, um, and, and I've seen some people get pretty pissed off about this stuff, you know, who have developed kind of brands around these varieties where yeah. they really have a lot invested in the truth, you know. Yeah, their version. They invested in their truth, you know. Yeah. Totally. Um, but yeah, you've done a lot of stuff with sour over the years, right? You've done you've been oh yeah. I mean, we back crossed it. So we were doing we were trying to do an outcross at one point, uh back crossing it. You know, this we had a sour times the original loud, which kind of you know started loud seeds was a uh, spicy jack on the sour diesel. Uh, the F2 is the original loud, and that was it wasn't Jackie. You think uh, anything Jack is gonna come out Jack? Well, no, those F2s came out pungent and sticky and uh the the turp profile was like sour diesel with a extra pungent back on it and mm. uh you know the structure was similar but it was a little tighter it finished problem with sour so sour is a typically i would say sour is a 12 week varietal so i think 12 weeks is optimal uh a lot of my friends pulled it in 10 uh outdoors a little little different it finishes when it finishes depending on the environment like casadero a, you know that that's where i feel like the best sours were grown in sonoma at least was in casadero because it's banana belt it was like the perfect environment for it to grow in sure. so but yeah so as far as what we've done we back crossed it we've i tried to make seeds of it through generations by crossing it with different things and to get that perfect sour seed but it's one of those things that doesn't come out yeah karma also he has like bx3s now and i think he's working on bx5s of his uh sour bx but it's not sour diesel it's a sour bx that's breeding towards that sour mm -hmm. and it's absolutely amazing i mean i've seen some of the bud from it and it's like fuck dude it's great but it's not sour diesel and so that's where i have a problem with people and i you know i'm guilty of it myself but with people saying they have sour diesel seeds you yeah. don't have sour diesel seeds. It's just not the case. Right. Um, and I've bred, you know, the Loudberry that won in 2014, that was, a, you know, the original Loud. That was basically the, the phenotype of the original Loud. And that was more berry terps. It smells like fresh squeezed uh, berries. Like if you were to drink a berry smoothie, along with that soury, gassy profile. Uh, Midnight Rider, who's one of my good friends, he's been working that line. And uh, he's bred it into some other stuff. I've bred it into other stuff, but yeah, sour has been the basis for where loud seeds came from in the beginning was, you know, I, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for sour. Um, right. it, it, and it was just such a game changer for outdoor growers, uh, late nineties, early two thousands in California. Uh, you know, it went from growing like the Mendo varieties to growing sour diesel because of the yield for one thing, but also the quality. It's like, these guys would ship them out of state. And they were getting four thousand dollars a pound for their outdoor, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like it is now, right? Yep. <laughs> Price is going back up. I, I think that's great for the you know the market too. And uh, the other thing is, is a lot of people don't know what real sour is. There's this big confusion on sour diesel, and people think it's oh well, sour diesel is okay. Well, it's probably because you never seen the real deal. Uh, the sour diesel because there's a West Coast cut that came out uh, and, and I think uh, Dark Heart sells the West Coast Sour Diesel. And so the deal with the West Coast is it does have a similar nose on it, but if you smoke a joint of it, if you smoke a big joint like this, you're gonna take a couple hits and it might taste a little soury, but like halfway down, it doesn't taste like anything. It tastes like shit basically. And it's because the amount of terpenes in that cut are less than 50% of the original. I have a friend that did a terpene uh, tests on both of them and it has less than 50% of the terps. It grows very similar, looks very similar, finishes a little earlier, but that West Coast cut isn't where it's at. And I think other people have also bred with that West Coast cut because it was readily available. Um, but yeah, and then there's like five or six different phenotypes of sour diesel that people claim that are out there. They, you know, the AJ sour diesel, I guess we can kind of go into that too. Uh, yeah. For the longest time, I thought AJ's was the lemony sweeter with gas, and the ECSD was like straight fuely version of sour diesel. Um, that's what we were giving them as back in the day. Which, uh, yeah, and then when I made seeds, I actually talked to AJ at a cup and was like, "Man, I wish I wouldn't, have, you know, called the sour diesel seeds AJ sour diesel." I apologized to him or whatever. 
back in the day, I thought it was kind of funny after the fact being AJ's and ECSD, like once I learned the actual heritage of what they were, AJ's is basically ECSD. Right, which is not sour. That was Soma's thing. Well, oh, right. Soma's was New York sour. Oh, New York, New York sour. In, in that's, that, yeah. Right, right. Now, Soma's, and Soma's was completely, completely a different variety. That was like some grapefruit freaking haze something. I'm not sure. But it, was, uh, it wasn't gassy. It, it, it's a good strain in its own. I, you know, I did some work with it. Um, I just crossed it with the Purple Tangy last year and made this strain called So Loud for Soma. Uh, that I got to get him the seeds now with the whole COVID thing, but uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting because sour is also one of the first varieties to, um, or possibly one of the early varieties to contract HPLVD and spread it around heavily. And so for a period, I was seeing a lot of people growing sour that just didn't come out right. And it, you started to question whether it was a different version of sour, was it a bad grower, or was it just that this viroid, now that we know, completely changes the terp profile, cannabinoid profile, and you come out with something that's just not quite right, you know? Well, it's yeah. tough because it doesn't express itself every time in every situation, so you can have some plants that have it and some plants that don't have it because of the way they're expressing it. And then you think the genetics are going to shit. And I think back over the years, like we had strains that, that absolutely, you grew them and then you were taking clones and they said, well, man, you can only take so many generations of clones, which we now know not to be true. But I, I thought that that was the problem with some of these varieties. We had this crazy purple bud that was like, uh, it, would, it would grow and it would look lime green and the end it would finish purple. And it was just called purple bud. But, mm -hmm. uh, these guys were telling me, oh, man, you took too many clones off it, man. Too many generations of clones ruined it. Well, I think it was probably HPLV, uh, you know, and then sour definitely around 2002. It's probably your fault, actually, that uh, the HPLV got spread out there. It could but, be. Uh, I mean, yeah. we don't know. I mean, there was definitely few people had that cut at the time. And the, one, of, one of the groups that did have it, uh, they were brewing which was a, a weird, like in the same location, they were brewing beer and they were growing sour diesel. And it had to happen that way. I mean, it had to be just a simple like, and, and we don't really know if it, if it came from, if you can transmit it from hops, from dried hops, do they have to be fresh hops? Does it have to be a fresh wound in the hop vine that then gets rubbed up against a, a cannabis plant? So how it leaped over from, from species okay. to species is well, tough because it doesn't express know. itself every time in every situation. So you can have some plants that have it and some plants that don't have it because of the way they're expressing it. And then you think the genetics are going to shit. And I think back over the years, like we had strands that that absolutely you grew them and then you're taking clones and they said, well man, you can only take so many generations of clones, which we now know not to be true. It's good. We got to hear this again because it's important. Right. Yeah, we got some hackers. <laughs> so, we got so, some so we get we got sour sour silicate uh, is with us. Let me just unmute him. I, I think he had the video playing in the background. Um, here, hold on. Or if you can unmute yourself, do you know how to do? Up oh, there we go. You know, and then sour definitely around two thousand. You, you, you got you got to pause the video you're watching though. The HPLV got spread out there. It could so, be. I mean, yeah. you know now. I mean, there was definitely. Yeah. Pause the YouTube. Pause the YouTube, and then. Um, I got it. I got it. There we go. He's a pro. Awesome. Uh, I'm just an old fart. <laughs> <laughs> Good to hear your voice, man. Um, yeah, I just want to first. Oh, I don't want to interrupt anybody. Keep on going. No, man. We want to know if we're if we're giving an accurate uh, story here, and you're the one to help us with that. Um, yeah, sound uh, so far so good. Any anything that we left out that you'd want to add just uh, before we move on to the the, the whole story, or or you want to? <laughs> I, I think I think uh, just did justice. You know, you guys are you guys are great. I really appreciate all the work y'all are doing um, through all the years. 
want to uh, give a shout out to the Cal Relief Fundraiser for everybody down in uh, Santa Cruz and the cannabis company down there. Also the glass blowers affected down in uh, Southern Oregon. I think uh, there's a glass artist, Lace Face, who's doing a, a, uh, a fundraiser for it all. So like, let's, let's keep everybody supported, help everybody out who needs some help out there. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. It's uh it's a, it's a crazy time. Everyone's getting impacted. I mean, you know, the cannabis industry is like cranking and then all of a sudden, you know, like we're the we're deemed essential and then all the fire comes and it's like, Oh yeah. Well, Kicking the teeth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally. So anyway, well, well, I'm, I'm stoked that you got on here, bro, because I, I feel like, you know, your story is, is it's a simple story, but it's really important. And, and you've just been a really humble guy all through this while everyone has been kind of trying to figure out like where did this amazing plant come from and and you didn't really want to step on anyone's toes or anything like that and you're just doing your own thing and becoming an amazing glass blower and 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 so i'm just stoked that you're that you're still in the game and and doing stuff and, and by the way can you yeah. can you model some of his glass <laughs> oh yeah i've got i've got pieces all over the place i mean i've got a few trinkets well, around yeah yeah no. <laughs> well this is one of my the latest ones which i really love these little hammers these are sick oh yeah yeah oh, i learned all that from uh yeah not only that but also beautiful <laughs> stemware stuff you know doing all kinds of killer shit and i think it's yeah. i think it's sick that both you and kim dog are are doing glass you know i think well, yeah. I was, yeah i was originally super inspired by chem dog at uh, all the you know special events and little things we would do as kids and uh, the concerts that i was really lucky to get to see as a kid um but besides the music because that was just one of the things that would draw us in or at least me or some people but it was uh, the makers and these crafts people you'd see outside it was just amazing after a while once you really focused, you know, and um, you could see what was going on around you and the textiles and the clothing and these things are being made. And then this, uh, you know, to hear about this magician, um, Bob Snodgrass, who was taking, you know, glass and uh, making it color changing and all this stuff. And he's this like folklore, you know, character and stuff to, to hopefully someday, one day meet, you know. Um, and even smoke out of the, you know, the, the mysterious dragon and stuff, you know, there's so much uh, really cool <laughs> stuff to it all. Um, but within all that, there was this character, uh, Chem Dog Glass. And if you were lucky enough to find him on the lot, you could Chem get Dog these, Glass. you could get these amazing pieces that this, that this guy would make. And uh, he was an amazing, humble character who, you know, was just there to share what his experience was with everything too. So, uh, big inspiration took a lot of big inspiration from him um but i just had to uh you know live out some cultivating dreams before i could dive into uh the glass um yeah i didn't really get um didn't really get to take the dive until i was really inspired by it um when i was in new orleans in 2000 in 1999 and 2000 and around Jazz Fest and I was at somebody's house and uh, I was really trying to figure out where to go <clears throat> and what to what to do next with my life because things were just kind of getting really out of balance and really crazy and um, there was we were at somebody's house in the garden district and um, this woman was like let me show you the most amazing thing in my house I'm like man I'm already in a house in the garden district in New Orleans what could be a more amazing than your house itself you know what I mean so within that, she puts a, a lampshade down on the table and within that she screws in a light bulb and in the light bulb is this like bouquet of flowers. So it's kind of like this light bulb going off my head of like, wow, man, maybe you could look into uh, glass art and moving things into a different direction and really making a craft that could be sustainable and something that would last much longer than you know, a joint today or, uh, you know, or that plant that's just going to get old and diseased and everyone's going to fight and argue about, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it just seemed like the perfect thing to then attach myself to. 
Um, and I was really lucky, really lucky that I, that, that I had glass come, come about to help me out. Yeah, man. Sorry, sorry to ramble. Sorry. To ramble. No, no, it's awesome because you know, when, when we reconnected, it was me coming out to Fort Bragg to you and, and the, the glass factory that you were working at and yeah, good times. Good times. It was good times, man. I'm still, I still have a tube from those days. That's too dirty to show on camera right now. I'd be <laughs> embarrassed. But you know, it it was it was a crazy time. And I and I want two shout outs. I'd like to just throw just into the mix here. One is is the dead. Thank you, dead, for making this happen because they did. It was a tribe that came out of that. And and I, I kind of grew up in that community as a kid. Um, and my um, my uncle, the guy I call my uncle, was the first road manager for the Grateful Dead, Jonathan Reister. Um, he's my dad's best friend, partner in crime. You know, the guy who taught me how to drive and shit like that. And but I, I was out of that community, you know, uh, by teenager. You know, I wasn't in the in the scene as much. You know, I would go to shows every now and then with my brother and stuff. But but then um, meeting you guys and kind of getting back into that circle and. And that brings me to the second shout out, which is Adam Dunn. And Adam Dunn, there's, I mean, it, it really, this has all happened because of the CIA. His little cannabis in Amsterdam shop, that's where we met. You know, that's where there was this, you know, as Rob Clark called it, it was the epicenter of the hemp universe or whatever. You know, it was, it was um, just a crazy time, this, this moment when it was still so small that if you got connected, you were really connected. That you, it wasn't like, it wasn't like fishing through your Instagram or LinkedIn followers thing. Or, you know, like all these people. It was like a real small little community, and there was super a, passionate people. Yeah, super passionate. And then for a while there, there was you know, um, at at Adam's place, Jason Harris, um, Jerome Baker had um, a glass blowing shop right next door or he had actually rented out part of the building and um so jason was over this is like 96 or 90 no probably 94 95 actually and so jason's there blowing glass all these cannabis off you know mel frank and rob clark and ed rosenthal they're all hanging out and and we're trying amazing weed from all over the world people are buying seeds from dutch companies and coming back and showing their wares and it was it was a real wild time, and that's that's how I met this this group of people and can have a relationship with Sour Diesel and all these guys and OG Kush for that matter. It was it was connections in Amsterdam that connected me to people in LA. Um, so it was it was just a really wild time, and that's how you know that's also where Sage and Sour came from, you know, which James you've worked with quite a bit and continue to work yeah. with, and that was. Love just, it. Yeah. An amazing marriage of two very different cultivars that yeah. combined made a, a really, a really killer plant. Yeah, and Adam and I actually have a whole lineup called Sage Against the Machine that, uh, you know, we got, those are all sage and sour crosses, kind of, you know, the evolution of sour, you know, working it into other strains like GMO and some of the popular stuff today, Legend OG times sage and sour and you know, the, the sour has a, a beautiful terp characteristic that if you can capture it, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, but it's one of those ones that doesn't, you know, as far as it doesn't always breed into stuff amazing. Uh, yeah. you, you know, you have to, and it's not even that it doesn't breed into stuff amazing. It's that it, it requires more pheno hunting than your typical variety. Right, right. Yeah. It, it's, you, you, there's, there's some traits in there that can be difficult to tame. You yeah, know. totally. Yeah. Um, but the, some of those crosses, and I have to say that the, probably the most potent plant that I ever grew was a cross from sour and um, sage, not, not sage and sour cross because it was from a different line of sage that I was working in LA in the, uh, around 2006 or 2007, I think is when that came out. And unfortunately, that was one of those varieties that got, got um, taken by you know, the early dispensary days when things weren't, weren't so your, your libraries weren't so stable, but those were killer. And, and me and sour silicate have, I've contributed some genetics to him and he's made some crosses with um, sage varieties and sour that are just insane. Gray water haze. Gray water haze, man. It's just, there's, there's a marriage there. And I just recently found out that my, my, my brother who I had done his own line 
um, of, um, he had done his own line of um, crosses of, I'd given him a bunch of sage seeds and like a true farmer, he's like a permaculture farmer in Mendocino back in the day. He didn't ever keep cuttings. He only every year started from seed every single year. So male, female, every single year and worked that line for about five years. And he developed a variety called Sendiva, which is also an amazing, you know, and it's really funny because the gray water haze, the Sendiva, the SD11, which is what I called my other cross and sage and sour are all very different, but they're all just from those two lines. And it really shows the diversity that can come out of it, but they're all like potent as hell and just super tasty. And it's just, yeah. The, yeah, the I mean, that, that sour imparts this couch lock. <laughs> if you capture it, right? It's like the outdoor stuff that tested at 14% is strong, as strong, if not stronger than a lot of these 30% plus varieties. And it's all, you know, that's, it's terpene based because of the specific terpenes that mercine, but it's not just the mercine. It's like mercine plus whatever else is in there. And some of those ones that are almost undetectable that just, you know, they give you that couch lock, like it, it's a good high, but man, it can be potent if you're not used to smoking sour like that. Yeah. yeah. That early, uh, that early chem two before yeah. the sour was like some of the most potent i mean we, we would drop people from like bubble hash from it and people would just like hit the ground you know you'd be at a concert and they would just smoke it and just bam just fall right out and you'd just be like uh let's help them up help them up <laughs> yeah those were varieties you could actually tell if you were at a concert you'd be like oh there's some fucking sour there's some og it's like yeah. i don't remember saying that a lot about a lot of varieties but Sour, it's definitely, you would recognize who is smoking the sour by the smell. And it might even be like 300 feet away. Yeah, and like nowadays, you know, things like sour, really good, a really good sour OG, you know, Gorilla Glue, all these things coming out now, if, if they're done right, and if everybody had those genetics, you probably wouldn't have concentrates. I mean, like <laughs> cannabis much over 30% yeah. anyways is almost really a waste at times. Um, yeah for some people because it's such it's so much man it's just yeah i don't know oh yeah dude i remember i mean there's certain terp profiles that floor me you know the, and and you you come you start to you see your patterns over time and sour yeah. diesel was definitely one of those varieties that would totally floor me and it would put me in a space where you just kind of it's not quite it's almost catatonic yeah right? you know you're just like uh, cold sweat and I remember specifically one time um, up in, uh, God, it was in, uh, in uh, Ukiah. I don't know if you remember this sour silicate, but you just floored me one time. And I got, in my, I got in my truck and started driving south. And I think I made it about a mile, pulled over. I was like, you know, I'm just going to sit here for about 45 minutes and I'm going to chill out. Because, and I, from that point on, I realized like, you know, sour diesel for me, that's that's some really strong strong effect, and that's well, it's why it's long that, too. Yeah, it's, it's a long, long high. man. And that diluted version with sage was always like, okay, I can I can hold on to this, <laughs> but you know, yeah, no, that's that's it's insane how how today. I mean, it is it really did add the punch. You know, those 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 fuely varieties really have, and even the even a lot of the stuff that's fruity now, the backbone and the the kick, the octane in that blend is often from OG and sour, even though yeah. the turf profile gets muted down, but it, you know, through whatever selection they make, but the, what really got them there was, was those, those profiles. So one thing I wanted to, I wanted to backtrack and ask about is the sour. So we all know the story about the soured relationships, but when you <laughs> first started calling sour diesel, sour diesel, was it because of the flavor? Of the aroma, um, I, I definitely liked uh, Sour Patch Kids. I, I liked. Uh, I I think it was more. I think it did have to do a lot. But it was more like because some of the people before us were just kind of saltier and they were really sour, and to get any kind of, you know, uh, cannabis. Uh, early on, uh, especially down in NYC, you know, you had to pay an arm and a leg for it. So it was just kind of like this in your face thing where you're supposed to be in this sort of like humble, like, oh, we all are one sort of like, 
you know, thing, but then like, yeah, that's going to be uh, $800 an ounce though. You know, it's just like, what? Like, it was just kind of this weird thing. And you asked to look at glass or you'd see somebody's glass at a show and like, no, you can't see that. You know, and they just like take it away from you. And so you'd be like, okay, I'm going to go over here. You know, it was just this weird sort of attitude. Maybe that's East Coast. Maybe that's just New York. But it was a really harsh sort of uh, vibe. And that it, it could be where the sour came from, mm. you know. Um, it was definitely something. I just took it. My friend had given me a packet. It was a packet of seeds. And they were wrapped up. And it said, our chem on them. And um, I, at that time, we didn't really talk about things. Man, there was actually privacy. And people were, like, really kept things on the low low and stuff and um and it was just the way we grew up it was just the way we you know we are and um where we were now I guess but um, but then yeah I saw that in the pack of seeds and there was just five of them so there was only one that came out of those five the rest of them you know were just what they were so the plant still had to be regenerated it still had to be cared for after it was harvested it's still there's so much that went into even the fact that it even survived and stuff that I think is so funny about it all. Um, but uh, yeah, well, you got a picture of that original crop, right? That very, yeah, 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 yeah. Kind of little Polaroid of that. Yeah, many time. have used it. Yeah, many have. Yeah, many have used it. But um, you know, and I think I think you guys do have it right. A lot of relationships did sour, and a lot of people who tried to uh, take the cup or you know. Um, wanted the cup without the race you know and the run for the roses and all that stuff I think was just more of like they were grabbing for straws because they didn't really have any kind of real reason why except for you know money this and that but what it was really all about was just freedom and having our own thing you know and our own freedom that's sort of like what the dream was I guess I don't know so so I got a question for you now there's several phenotypes of sour diesel like AJ's, ECSD, um, I've heard of several other ones, West Coast. Was there only one sour diesel phenotype that you kept or was there other ones that were given out along with that first uh, sour well, diesel? The, the, or first one, the first one was given, first one was given in New York City to people in New York City. When yeah. I left, it was given to everybody on the West Coast. Humble, yeah. Eugene, I mean, all the same stuff. It's all mine. But it all came from one seed, not yeah. five seeds that were given nope. out, correct? Nope, 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 nope. One yeah, so I, I have a feeling those are all bag seeds. All these West Coast and all these things are just possibly bag seeds of the sour that came out similar. Possibly. Uh, or they could have been, yeah, I mean, there's there's other thoughts too. But yeah, I, you know, it's funny because uh, one of my friends had his stuff tested through a company similar to Phylos. And... Uh, he had they, they were all slightly different the ones that he gave him samples of so <laughs> maybe bag seed i don't know no all i know is nobody was calling anything sour before before you know me right. and my, my crew so it's like yeah you know and anything after that is either just variations of it or um sure. someone else's version which is great that, that's fine i'm glad you got something to do you know it's like, <laughs> but the, 707, <laughs> the 707 headband is an og kush the 707 headband is someone's version of headband i think yeah it's og sour it's og sour right yeah. exactly yeah yeah so that was a that was an interesting time too when you first got og and that was that was um you know kind of the right before you left california that that it was like your last little gift to the cannabis community. You're like, hey, I'm going to give you guys headband. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was from the same. So yeah, it was just it was just another sort of uh, thing. Uh, the New York stuff, uh, you know, that early New York City diesel looked starkingly just like the OG Kush. I mean, it's it's it was so close in that same like hard like a uh, golf ball-y sort of structure you know was not conical it was more of these like puff balls and stuff um really tight beautiful skunky and it would yeah i mean it would wrap a band around your head and stuff so um so it just sounded or it just seemed like it would fit you know with it all and then we'd see if it would how much it would stir up, what it would conjure up, you know, with all of that too. 
Right. It kind of, it's kind of funny because it, it was like a, a a marker in that, like, if you called it at that point, if you called it headband, I knew exactly where it came from. <laughs> if you called it OG, I knew definitely where it an indicator. Yeah, it's definitely like, an indicator. Yeah, it was a like total indicator. Yeah. It was crazy. I just realized I just talked chatting with some guy on um, online recently, and um, he told me that he in 2010 won the Emerald Cup with a, a Sage um, Sour Cross called um, Sour Best Shit Ever SBSE. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I remember hearing about that shit. <laughs> yeah, I know. I want to try it too, definitely. But I, I was like, man, and I, it just started making me think. I'm like, that's another Sage and Sour Cross that's different. You know, totally wild. So, um, so anyway, strangest just, life I've ever known. What's that? It's the strangest life I've ever known. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it keeps getting stranger to tell the truth. But you know, it's it's wild that we're all still connected, and you know, I think that yeah. It, yeah. I think you did it. You did a good service to humanity by not only getting that one seed to germinate, but also being a custodian of that plant for all those those years and helping to put it in other people's hands. Well, and I knew that whatever I chose to do afterwards, if it was gonna be glass or, or start a family or do something, I was gonna do it with as much passion and intent as I did with uh, when we were cultivating cannabis as, as kids, you know, it was, uh, it was a really, really great time in my life. I was really around some, some really amazing people and um, and uh, yeah, I was really lucky for that. And moving into the next stages with the glass, it was it was just as amazing because I met just as amazing as uh, in many incredible people through that as well. I remember uh, Robert Mickelson, who's like who's so amazing, incredible glass artist. Um, one of his my favorite quotes from him was saying, you know, well, it's from Bob Dylan. But it was, you know, those who aren't busy being born are busy dying. And um, it was always a big thing to me to always continue on with the mystery of life and not just get shackled or stuck in one idea of like, you know, uh, of, of uh, you know, delusions of grandeur or something. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was for the people by the people. Mm -hmm. uh, that's basically all it was. It was a team of us. And something happened, you know, and it and it and it worked. We're really glad about that. Yeah, man, synergy. And it, it's wild how big the industry's become, you know, and and how far these cultivars have gone. I mean, I, there's probably a grow room in Antarctica right now with some sour diesel in it. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it seriously, you know, and, it, and it's just why and not and also there's a freaking, you know, 10 acre grow on some you know millionaire investment group that's you know heavily funded big corporate cannabis that's also growing sour diesel so it's like it, it it's really wild how this cottage industry that we we're all a part of back in the day has really created this new modern incarnation and and i don't think it would be the way it is today if it wasn't for efforts like yours in sour diesel and og kush and some of these pivotal um, early varieties that we gave them the opportunity to create something bigger. And we did it out of our garage or our basement or our little back room with a couple of lights, you know, it's just- Yeah, we're just, we're just an evolution of the Grateful Dead. I mean, honestly, I feel, I've, I've said that for years, but I feel like companies like Lagunitas and, you know, modern day companies, but I feel like, especially us in the cannabis industry, we were like, touched by this thing that impacted us and changed us forever and we're just the you know the next expression of what the grateful dead is in another form hmm. so we're cannabis like lagunitas they have their expression in beer and there's so many people that it touched you know that it just kind of spread out there it's like uh well at least we're the good side of weed yeah same with, it's the same with the glass industry though too and, and all the glass kids man nobody believed in all the pipe kids in the beginning it was all oh, a big yeah. struggle and then bam, look, man, it, it's an incredible thing to be a part of now, you know, and the guys in the seventies knew it then too. They were like, all oh, this is just going to take time. And yeah. this younger generation is going to get right into this, you know, and, and 
it's it's you know it's one of the greatest things to be a part of myself to be you know in the glass world and and uh be making stuff and the things that i've learned from people you know i'll never forget i can i can make stuff until i'm like you know until i die now you know it's amazing i love that analogy james between the, the grateful dead and the industry because the grateful you know the industry's had all our these these developmental challenges as we're becoming adults and we're you know become agriculture and science and medicine and all these things but at the core of it is what where we came from which was about community and sharing and providing and and you know that that's kind of like what what sour silicate was talking about earlier about you know what, what we're doing this for is to is for ourselves and for our community you know yeah. and, and there's and the dad was like, hey, you know, yeah, I understand that we're a big rock and roll band, and you know, but I still demand that everyone can come here and record our shows. Yeah, you know, and imagine what the industry, the record labels were just like, fucking mind, like, ah, you know. But they're like, no, we're yeah. big enough that we get to make that call, you know. And to some degree, I think that we've maintained that in the cannabis industry too. That we're like, no, it's corporate cannabis now. Yeah, it's big international business. But guess what? We're still a community and we're still connected and we're still looking out for each other because yeah. that's what cannabis is about. It's about creating this plant and sharing it with people because the person who creates in it, creates it, believes in it and sees the power there. And instead of saying, wow, I see the power here. I'm going to hold it for myself and capitalize off it and turn it into a commodity and take all the profit. You're, you're almost more driven to share it. It's yeah. like, it's like, it's like a, you know, the loud profile is like, is like, get me out there, <laughs> share me with the world. It's like, you smell that crop from miles and miles away. Can't hide yeah. it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, it's, it's really wild. Yeah, been a long, been a, a long, strange trip it's been to be. For sure. To... <laughs> so we got a bunch of questions and comments. Um, Rob says, Mo, more on the Emerald Triangle strain. Was it an ancestor of TK? I thought TK was named after three Floridian cities. Yeah, that is that was what we all thought at first. It was the triangle between uh, um, Gainesville and Daytona and whatever. No, it, but that that was the eye opener to me. And you know, me and Rob Clark had written a. a um, a piece called The Curse of Kush a year a couple of years ago, year and a half or so. And what we what we we highlighted in that piece was how Afghani genetics were inherited and certain traits were brought into the modern cannabis gene pool, along with it powdery mildew issues and stuff like that, you know. And um, and so at the time we and we we drew a core, we do we drew some relation to OG Kush from that Hindu Kush origin, but it wasn't to say it was a direct connection. It was just to say these Afghani based plants, which OG clearly has Afghani um, traits in it, brought all these other characteristics. And then like a couple of weeks later, Josh D calls me up and he's like, dude, it is Hindu Kush. I met the guy <laughs> here. You want to come meet him? And he comes up to Cali, you know, the origins TK. And he tells me the story and I was totally blown away that the triangle, the word triangle in Triangle Kush came from the Emerald Triangle. That was the cut that they were growing that they called the Emerald Triangle. And that was, a, they got it direct from NorCal straight to Florida and they were blowing that up. And they went out looking for some new genetics and they got some Hindu Kush seeds from Neville Seed Bank in the late 80s, 88, 89. And they were working some of those lines and they hermied and um, pollinated the triangle. And the seeds that came out of that batch of flower would be popped by, that would create the Emerald Triangle. It would also create OG or at the time what they called Supernaut by a guy, um, Alec. Alec, I can't remember his last name, but um, so those were the beans. It was Emerald Triangle, and that is, as far as I know, the story. And yeah, there is the triangle down there, but it just that's just a, another coincidence. Uh, all right, so we I'm 
God, this is tiny font. Uh, Genetic Memory Farm said, so have all the best slash notable today's strains come from home slash hobby breeders? If so, why should we buy seeds from big companies? And then said, Lagunitas is Heineken, by the way. <laughs> a big yeah, company. Lagunitas is Heineken, but Lagunitas started out. So, so Tony, I used to work with Lagunitas a lot. I used to go to their 420 parties. Um, you know, some of you guys might know them as Heineken. I love that you're about, to, you're, you're about to defend the honor of Lagunitas. I am, because, because Lagunitas really did come from a great place. Uh, Tony, the owner, I'm friends with a bunch of guys that started Lagunitas. A um, guy named Jimmy who, uh, you know, Jimmy and Ron, they brought me into Lagunitas, but Lagunitas and, and Ron is just straight deadhead, but like a lot of their foundations, those guys all smoke weed, and those guys are all passionate about Grateful Dead, passionate about music. You know, Tony did sell his company originally. He sold half of it for half a billion, the other half for a billion, and, uh, you know, I, I don't think their beer has changed. It may change in the future, but, you know, this is all in the last, like, three years. Their Lagunitas IPA, uh, you know, it, it stayed through with Heineken, let them do it their way. But those guys gave more to charity than any other company I've ever known or worked for. Yeah, you know, a huge portion of their, their, their profits compared to most companies were used for charities. Um, it's just, you know, anytime I, I'm also a chef and I used to throw events and stuff like that and do charity events, they would always donate to those events. So I have a lot of respect for Lagunese. But uh, what was the other question that was attached to that? What, what, if just why, why we should buy, uh, why, oh, if y'all can uh, say, no, cottage. I wouldn't say that all these great varieties are all made from bag seeds. There's stuff that's been bred, but a lot of the stuff is bag seeds. I mean, I think you got to look at the individual breeders. There's a lot of hype involved with genetics. Uh, no. You know, I do, I do large scale seeds for outdoor production is one of the things I've really focused on now. But uh, also these varieties, it's, it's tough because you can go buy a clone of something and you're probably going to have more six. I would say that clones are a better option for most home growers than actually going and buying a seed pack because you're getting that one phenotype uh, and you don't have to separate males and you don't have to worry about stuff as far as selection and phenotypical variation. The thing is with buying seeds, you got to pheno hunt stuff. So there's a lot of work involved. Now there's great companies that make great seeds you know, aficionado, swamp boy, there's, there's tons of companies like that. I love their seeds. Uh, you know, Jay has been doing some really interesting stuff on that modern, you know, very nouveau style of genetics that goes away from all the stuff, which is high terpenes, high uh, THC, um, but it's all that modern stuff. And then you got the old guys like Mojave and myself and you know, a handful of other guys that have been breeding for a long time. And we have a lot of stuff that's amazing as well, even though it might not be current or as trendy, some of the stuff that I've done, uh, it'll come back around. One thing I've seen with genetics is it always comes back around. Everyone's talking about purple these days. For the last 10 years, nobody wanted purple. Nobody wanted anything with color in it. And now all of a sudden, if it doesn't have color, it's not going to fetch the same price. Mm -hmm. So these things, they go in cycles. Uh, but yeah, know your breeder, you know, do your research. Uh, there's tons of good stuff out there. If you have no access to clones, seeds are great. And, you know, I, I make seeds and I make money off seeds. That's what I do for a living. But, uh, you know, I think I'm offering something special a lot of times and uh, without the hype around it. And I think there's other guys that are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. you just got to go uh, check stuff out. Yeah. And I'd add to that, that, you know, a big, a big corporate food producer, you know, it, it's cannabis is like food. Cannabis is way more complex than any other plant, but the core around how it's produced and, and distributed and consumed is very similar to food products. And, you know, every major food commodity out there owes it to some person, some small farmer, you know, or someone seed hunter, someone who went out in, in, sourced some apple seeds that they would brought back and made a clone of it made 50 billion apple cuttings from that one seed you know so it's 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 once you have great material to work with it's not so much you know that that the corporate people can't do i mean look at look at uh 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 
Driscoll's Berries or something like that. You know, like they, they've become, they were a small family farm up in Santa Cruz and they got good genetics and they learned how to breed new varieties. And now they grow and sell berries all over the world. And they're a big corporate berry company now, you know, but it's, it's more about the, the original source material, you know, and so, so yeah. And, and see, one thing I'd add to, to James about the, the seed thing is it's, I had this interesting conversation with someone recently who is a, a pheno hunter. And I realized that this guy has found lots of great phenos over the years, but he doesn't stop hunting. And I realized I had this epiphany. Oh, it's hunting. It's like fishing. It's like hunting. It does. It's not about what you catch. It's about yeah. doing it. You know, guys go out there and stand the cold for three days to go bear hunting with the crossbow, not because they're hungry and they don't have any meat in their deep freeze. It's because they love to hunt. And with seeds, it's an adventure every time. You don't know what you're going to get. And sometimes you find things that resonate with you or with someone else. And you might get a unicorn. You yeah. might get a unicorn. You usually get a mule, <laughs> but there's a lot of <laughs> yeah. unicorns out there, you know. No, I, I, I think that that's it. And, and yes, 100% do all these big seed companies owe their to owe, owe something to the founders that gave that brought these genetics in? Yeah, we do. But that's, that's the nature of agriculture that it always starts, yeah. especially with with colonially produced plants, you know, look at, look at wine. Where's the cab? Where's the guy who, who, who who did the first Cabernet or the first Pinot? He's, this has happened a long, long time ago, but it was probably some small vineyard where someone had this amazing variety and it was it doesn't breed true. You can't just pull seeds out of the grape and then plant them. You have to get a clone. And, you know, that's, that's just the way it works. So you can be, but, but at the same time, you know, hey, always try to source from, you know, try to source your food from local small producing people if possible. You know, I do, I do think that that's always support your community whenever possible, but there's nothing wrong with, there's nothing wrong with corporate cannabis. I don't want to sound like I'm someone who's like against the idea that we've turned this into a big industry because everyone should have access. And it, sometimes it takes bigger distribution capability and stuff like that to provide access. But, yeah. So just quickly, uh, the stuff's like blowing by on my screen in the chat. Uh, Antonio Reyes said, when my, dad's, when my dad first smelled sour diesel, he said they had something like it when he was younger called the puck. The puck may be related to dog butt. And then Jacob Schwank said the puck is skelly hash plant. Hmm. Never heard of it. So the puck, I've seen the puck. Uh... Jason Brooks had a cut of it in flower when I was there, I believe, and it it smells potent. I don't remember it smelling super sour, but maybe. Yeah, there's, I mean, I know I've heard from people who, you know, who claim that they've smelled things that had that in, they, it could have been the Thai origin. I've heard a number of times that people say that, that the, the, the lemon profile from of sour came from Thai weed. I've heard it also from India. You know, it's, I mean, there was a lot of amazing herb. You got to think back in the day, every, nothing was from clone. So every time you got to smoke, you tried something different. And if you were lucky enough to have a source that was bringing in import weed, for instance, that was relatively fresh, then man, you got to you know, I was I was a young lad in the 70s, but I got to experience a lot of um, different unique flavor profiles. And th there was way more diversity then than there is now. That's for sure. There's more varieties available now, but those varieties all have common ancestors. So there's it's a different type of diversity. It's it's it's, you know, so back in the day, you would have something and you try it. And it would be amazing and have this intense profile, this intense effect, and you'd never see it again. So it just no. becomes this distant memory of like, you remember that time that we, that thing, that Eric Clapton concert and that guy passed me that thing. And it was like, you know, so, and we don't have the analytics to go by. So they're all just memories, are, they're sense memories, which are not necessarily the most reliable sources of data, you know, but. Yeah. It was something. It, I mean, it had to come from somewhere. It didn't didn't just create itself, you know. And it had to come from some land race variety that got brought in, 
to California likely and someone developed it a little bit, maybe crossed it a couple times and then it became dog butt or Emerald Triangle or whatever, you know. So, all right, hold on. Uh, we got like 650 people watching right now and the, the chat stuff streaming by. So Fatty Roots uh, asked, can you ask more about being able to clone continuously without weakening the genetics, please? So no need for mother plants or did I misunderstand? No, you need mother plants, but you can also clone off clones. I feel like uh, plant health is the most important thing and not having viruses and viroids, you know, definitely helps. But uh, taking a clone off of a clone to make a mom and then taking a clone off of that for, you know, since 1991, the chem dog is st still being grown and still amazing. Sour diesel is still being grown and still amazing. And these varieties are 30 years old that people have been doing most likely multiple uh, clone off of clone or clonal generations for 30 years. And, you know, DJ Short said something to me a long time ago about it, like, because uh, I was talking about tissue culture, something else. And he's like, all you have to do is take a clone and put it out in the sun, have it connect to the earth. And uh, I thought it was kind of funny at the time, but I, you know, I realized that that summer we had, we had definitely taken some stuff out. And by June, some of the varieties that we had were like super healthy. And I'm like, fuck, DJ, he was right. Daniel was right. Yeah. Uh, there's, so there's something to do with plant health. I mean, you can say vibration of the earth, all these other things, but at the end of the day, if you can get that new growth, you know, and have it really healthy, you, you're going to continue that, the health of that plant for, you know, hundreds of generations potentially. Right. And, and conversely, when you create a optimal growing condition for the plant, typically indoors, you also create optimal growing condition for pests and pathogens. Yeah. So they don't go away. They're like, oh, perfect. Oh, you're going to keep me between 72 and 78 degrees and 45 to 65% humidity for year after year after year after year. Whereas you put a plant outside, there's extreme fluctuations in temperature. There's extreme fluctuations in light. There's a lot more air flow, a lot more air movement. And there's possibility of UV, A, B, and C all working to keep the plant going, but also to to kind of say, hey, you have to work to survive. And like a really cold night and a warm day, as we know with tissue culture, that the thermotherapy has a lot to do with reducing the viral load, that you have to stress the virus to the point where it, you've reduced it enough that you can take a cutting off the meristem that has far less of the viroid potential in it so that when you start growing it, you've kind of outgrown and grown away from what's stuck in that vascular system. So. The outdoor thing is totally true. And that, I mean, I've heard that from a number of OGs back in the day. It's like, it might even take, I've heard like, hey, it might take three years of having a plant in an outdoor environment to get it back to a point of health. And this is before we knew about hop latent viroid, but what they were saying to me was, you have to put that through all these stressors that you can reduce the viroid. Cause the viroid is trying to capital, is trying to take over the plant essentially but it also wants the plant as a host. So it's not trying to kill the plant. That's why it's the latent viroid. It's not, it's not like trying to consume it and be done with it like a lot of other, like, like, like mites, for instance. They're trying to fucking eat that plant until it's gone and you can't possibly survive. So I think there's something there, you know, that, that um, we gotta be careful when we're keeping clones alive. And sour diesel was one of the first, I really do think it was one of the first to show, um, completely different um, terpene cannabinoid profile, like where it's just like night and day, like, dude, how come this crop is just complete shit? Like what happened, yeah. you know? Completely and dudded out. Completely it loses, uh, yeah, I mean, it loses basically the resin, the the lipids, uh, you know, it ends up being a dry, and the stuff is, it, sour diesel is already, uh, you know, open bud structure. So when you have something that's an open bud structure that starts becoming dry, you know, the, and the, terpenes are significantly less and changed, you know, that, that's when a lot of people stop growing it too. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's a, and it's a 12 week plant, like you say, and nowadays yeah. people are like stuck in this, Hey, I've got to get everything up, done in eight weeks. That's my, that's our production model. That we no, have no, five is the new eight people want <laughs> the five week varieties. 
it's impossible you know yeah i've never i've never had i've never tried a variety that was under seven weeks that worked for me i mean there's yeah. some of them were chunky and and potent but nothing that ever had any nuance to it it's just you know. yeah the bubble was like a 53 day and uh i just i just got a phenotype of this one seed that's been hunted that apparently is a 43 day but the last time someone gave me a 45 day og it finished in 70 days so nice nice yeah there, there was one other thing i wanted to ask um sour silicate about the um the early days, um, unless you have another question that you want to throw out there while I'm trying to think, Peter. Well, just while you're looking for it, I asked uh, where everyone's tuning in from and uh, let me scroll way back up. Uh, Colorado, Vegas, Scotland, Massachusetts, Washington, Germany, Michigan, Texas, Czech Republic, Ireland, Ohio, Oakland, New England. We got some Boston people. I'll be watching the Pats game in a couple hours. Uh, Belgium, a bunch of people threw down their area codes. Denmark, Indiana, Maryland, Trinity. I think someone was from uh, the I saw a Caribbean somewhere. Um, nice. Florida, Maryland, Arizona, Alaska. Uh, Bakersfield, Fuel House Farms, Bakersfield. Home of the cows. Oh yeah, Guadeloupe, uh, French West Indies, Jamaica. Uh, <laughs> some red state people who probably <laughs> you can mention the red states aren't, aren't yeah. allowed to grow. No, no, no. He just said red state with a sad face. <laughs> he didn't say the state. <laughs> uh, Jay Diz, what state specifically? Um, Is that typical for you to get? Um, viewers from all around the world like that or are you tapped into is this a is this more of a yeah no and that's why whenever people ask me like what's the best time to go live i'm kind of like it's a good time somewhere in the world for someone like you know everybody has their different lives like some people are like i want to watch stuff at 8 a.m or 9 p.m or right in the middle of the work day or so some time of, for these conversations, for us, it's Sunday at 1230 in the afternoon in California, but for other people, it's like 2 a.m. or, um, you know, I mean, we, we sometimes we do stuff at like eight or nine at night in California and people are like just waking up in South Africa and like all the South Africans pour in and they're like, what up, can of fam? <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, I forgot what my question was, but I guess, um, I guess we pretty much hit most of the topics. Is there anything else you wanted to add, Sour Silicate, to this conversation before we... So it's 5 a.m. in Australia, says Ice Friction. So That's Australia amazing. is in the house. Quebec. I played That's hockey at Laval during the summers in junior high and high school. Sour yeah. Silica, go ahead. That's amazing. That's just amazing. Uh, there's all the interest and, and everyone listening. Uh. <laughs> LSD Locks is in Thailand right now. Live People long and prosper. Rob S. said relationship between dog bud and the Emerald Triangle strain ancestors of Chemdog? Question mark. Yeah, I, I think we kind of covered that. Uh, we don't know. We don't know if that's, that's just, I'm, I'm just basing that off of my own experience talking to people from the Kush side and from the sour diesel side that there, it's just a coincidence that it both stems out of this Northern California cultivar. And it's also a coincidence that the sour diesel guys with the first time that I would show them Kush, they would go, that's the diesel. That's the, that's the, the diesel from back in the New York days. So to me, it's a real strong, I mean, there's, there's, it's not like showing someone super skunk or, or, or skunk one or, or Northern lights. It wasn't like, oh yeah, it's a similar thing. It was like, there's clearly some, some common thread there. And there was a lot of, a lot of mishmash herb being grown in the late eighties in California. Everything had been hybridized at that point. So there was like this, like 
the Mindo Blendo era, you know, where it was, Mindo like, Blendo. it was just a blend, man. It was like a blend of everything. And it almost lost its, its essence because of that, you know? And I think the dog bud was, a, was just a little bit less of that, that it was still had a real strong um, characteristic. And, and if, if it was what was the parent between all of those, then that would explain a lot on where the gas came from. Um, but it's, it's hard to tell, man. You know, you look at, you look at people, use people as an example. And when you, when, when people of different ethnicities, um, make babies, the babies often look like you can't tell what the ethnicity is anymore. You know, they, where they look, where are you Hispanic based or are you Southeast Asian or are you Middle Eastern or whatever? So, so there's, there's these common, these common traits that just carry over and, and, and we don't know. It's funny. Well, my, my know. two daughters are half Chinese and I must have very strong genes because they both look like spitting images of me. Like they, they don't look <laughs> like they're, <laughs> they don't look know. Chinese. Right. But their children will. Well, if they have enough of them, if they have, if they have a bunch of children, you know, the, the Mendelian a certain percent reading. of the progeny, right. yeah. <laughs> pink flowers, white flowers and red flowers, you know? Yeah, yeah. no, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a great, a great mystery. We'll never know. So the American one asked, is there any real chocolate tasting strains? Please ask these guys. There were. Sure. Right. Yeah. They're Over. definitely. Chocolate's kind of chocolate tasting a little bit. Chocolate, there was some Thai stuff that definitely had some chocolatey notes in yep. it. Yeah, chocolate chunk. Uh, yeah, the chocolate Thai chocolate was chunk. definitely had had um, definitely. It was more of the bitter chocolate side. It wasn't right. like it wasn't like a you know super sweet milk chocolate. It was that kind of like that that slightly spicy bitter note from chocolate and yeah. You know, but we don't know. I can only imagine. I mean, if you think of if you think of what import herb had to go through before it got here, and if it still smelled and tastes good, man, it must have been amazing when it was being grown. You know, it's just we'll never know. And and hopefully some of those land race varieties were preserved off in some tiny corner of Thailand or India or somewhere, and we'll get to experience that at some point. But we don't know. Maybe we'll just be left with with the uh, the remnants. The distant memory. The distant memory. Yeah, we've lost. I, I like this thing. I like to say, like we've lost the wolves, and all we're left with is the chihuahuas. <laughs> Sweet. That's, that's kind of yeah. yeah. I mean, oh, there, we got so huskies, many... huskies and malamutes are still there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we lost a lot of good ones along the way. I mean, there's been so many great varieties that I haven't seen in 20 years. You know, but I have friends that claim they have seeds of it. That's the best part. It's like all these guys are. I got it in seed form. It's not the same. Such, such as what? Super Silver Haze, uh, the one that was floating around in 1997 in the Bay Area was very different than the Super Silver Haze most people know today. Uh, we had Cat Piss. Cat Piss is like another one uh, that was, you know, mind blowing. But there, there was a ton of stuff coming around. There was a strain called the Spaceship in the Bay Area that was like, you would trim it and you would have gray resin glands on your scissors, you know, because it was so high and I mean, there's still some stuff around like the afgu, like the real afgu. I just got back from somebody, but uh, man, there's been, you know, Jack Flash. I don't know if anybody still has the original Jack Flash that was floating around the beer. That's another one that was like, not what you think of as Jack. It was, you know, triple A, even to this day, if you had that, bud, it was resinous and, and chunky and the high from it was amazing, but the terps, a 10th of a gram would smell your whole house up. Whereas you don't really see that with stuff anymore. It's like, same thing with that cat piss. It's like a 10th of a gram and people would, you know, second they go in your house, they're like, fuck man, where's all the weed? And it's like, you're looking around for it. And it's this little piece that's in your top pocket. Right. Um, yeah. Where's the dead cat under your house? Yeah. I mean, some weed used to be so foul smelling that it just, it really smelled like there was something dead. I mean, I, I remember back in the day, neighbors actually really thinking like you've, You've got to get rid of that dead cat, <laughs> because it and no, not even thinking in a million years that it was cannabis, because yeah. it wasn't herbaceous smelling at all. It wasn't fruity. It was a dead cat. You know, there was a lot of a lot of good stuff. The the Asian fantasy is like the classic story. Like if you read the Canna Bible, that like this most amazing variety that I've ever tried, according to Jason King, like 
disappeared and you know and it didn't disappear but it disappeared in its original form you know so there's hybrids of it out there but the original asian fantasy is is gone before most people could even try it so yeah and ju just quickly because you're both cali boys uh what Stu moo a while ago asked what happened to the real cali orange bud from the 90s well, the Cali orange takes like 18 weeks to finish. <laughs> so you're not going to see a lot of people growing it. You know, there's stories that, you know, Tangi evolved from it and other things. I, I, I actually have a friend who I think probably still has it, but I haven't, I haven't honestly seen it in probably 15 years. And it's just one of those ones that takes so long to flower. If you can do something, you know, two times the amount you can do one, why would you grow that one? It's really hard to justify yeah. And, uh, you know, it requires a certain climate, too, because it finishes so much later than a lot of the other stuff. Yeah. And the Calio that I remember back in the day um, wasn't super potent or super tasty. Um, it was uh, just super orange. It was yeah, like and really, it was a little it, rindy, too. I mean, it was, it was rindy. Was it was super orange and super... I had stuff that I thought was pretty pretty amazing but it was all outdoor growers typically you didn't yeah. i didn't see guys doing that indoors no you know back in the day it was called an orange bud when i was a kid and it just had incredibly bright orange um pistols and it really tasted like orange and it was like it was it was almost that that um that thing where people and i think we're in this weird we're in this weird transition now where the flavors are so good that that's almost driving people's decisions in terms of what they like to consume and sour diesel is a perfect example of a variety that tastes amazing but also had the kick to back it up where calio was like an amazing tasting variety that didn't really have the kick and it didn't really produce the the thc content you know and it just didn't kind of like tangy how tangy is now in the sense where Tangy's cool. Tangy's won probably more awards than any other variety, variety but uh, as far as potency, it's not one of those ones that's super potent. It's like, it's not the most potent. It's, uh, you know, and I think people are really in the market for stuff that gets them high. Uh, and it's not, a, you know, it, it, eventually it's not going to be about THC content. Right now they get a dispensary and they're like 35%. That's what I want. I feel the future and, you know, with more education, I feel like it's kind of already going that way in Colorado. But in California, uh, it's definitely going to start going more in that direction. People want brand specific stuff, obviously, but they start looking for terpene profiles instead of just high THC. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Appropriate terpene profiles. No, yeah. we, we need that to happen because we need people, we need the consumers to give us the feedback that they're getting the varieties that they want. And instead of us force feeding them varieties, which is really easy to do when, when, when herb is so beautiful and so tasty and smells so good, it's like, there's not a lot of bad herb out there. There's not a lot of, people aren't growing a bunch of bad varieties like they were. I think they are. Well, yeah, <laughs> there's, there's things that I don't like. And I, I agree with you. There's, there's herb that I, I think, but what I mean is that they're dynamic. So it's like, it's like a fast food kind of type of herb where it's like really easy to sell kids sugary soft drinks. They yeah. don't have to be good. They don't, they don't have to taste like anything. They're just, fucking wallops of sugar mixed in with water and a little food coloring and all of a sudden you're in it and now we've got these spoken by products. someone who has kids <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. well no it's true i mean we're really we are we're we have the same susceptibility to color and smell and taste as any other insect in the garden you know so we're, we're really driven to that and you talk to guys that run distribution now and they'll tell you like Oh, dude, no one wants to buy sativas anymore. They were all the rage back in the day. But now the first thing they ask me is, what are the numbers? And is it purple? And, you know, is it is it super tasty? So they're not, people aren't really shopping for, they're not trying to pair uh, a, can, a cannabis profile with whatever their, their desired effect is, as much as the distributors saying, look, purple weed sells, <laughs> you know? So it's like, okay, well, I get it, you know? And, and fast food was sold really well for a long time until people realized that it was killing them and they weren't getting good tasty food, you know? So I think we are now like experiencing all this amazing accessibility that we're kind of giving, we're delivering it to the hands of the market and the market will 
kind of take the reins and turn it into a cheap commodity. And, and we're seeing that. We're seeing that, you know, everyone wants dessert item based cannabis now. It's the rage, the wedding cakes and all that stuff, you know. Um, yeah. But, but the growers all have their own varieties that they grow for themselves. Like, I don't smoke that stuff. This is just the stuff I grow to sell. It's like, what? yeah. What the no, hundred percent. <laughs> What's that? No, about? <laughs> the best, the best growers smoke their shit, and yeah, I feel like, yeah, it's a tough one. But there yeah. is a lot of stuff that's just it's trendy, and it's going to change, and it'll go away from that. You know, we had fruit forward, then it was desserts, and now it's like you want the the perfect mix of everything, so you want the one that's got the color. It's got to have the gas. It's got to have some sort of floral character to it it's got you know it's got to be a gelato basically you know anything gelato and now there's like 500 gelato strains out there and i would say that maybe 10 of them or 15 of them are unique and that's it i think you know people call one thing something but it's not really genetically different than the next one mm -hmm. yeah so, so uh mojave uh rob asked for clarification is mo saying purple is like fast food <laughs> Purple <laughs> equals no gas. Yeah, well, I am and to an extent. What I'm saying, I'm not saying purple equals fast food because there's a lot of great purple weed. And but what I'm saying is that we're in this period where, you know, we used to have the ability. You know, we used to go to someone's house and sit there, and they'd bring out a bag of weed, and you'd look at it. And then we went to a dispensary where they'd open a jar, and you got to kind of engage with the weed. And now what we're engaging with is brands. So how well you market your brand really has a lot to do with how successful you are at selling that variety. And then when, when, when we've created varieties that smell and taste like, like delicious food, we're tapping into other uh, associations that our mind has with other things in our lives. So the effect of cannabis comes after you experience the flavor profile. So when you're being driven by the flavor profile, you're chasing that thing. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Flavor is fantastic. Aroma is fantastic. But to me, um, if I had to swallow a bitter pill to get the effect that I want, I'll do that before I taste something, a sweet pill that doesn't give me the effect. So we have to, we have to just remember that cannabis changes the way people think and behave and perform in their daily lives. And we want to create varieties that facilitate that more than just things that are dynamic and tasty and colorful. And now we've got the most beautiful looking weed ever. I mean, these orange pistols on, on like neon green and purple hues, it's insane. But as, a, as a, a lifetime smoker, I know that that doesn't mean anything about the effect. So I'm, I'm not gonna be driven by that. I'm gonna say, yeah, if I could get all of those attributes in the effect that I want, then I'd be stoked. But if what's driving the market is first, it has to be purple, then you're taking a bunch of things that have a real purpose and you're just discarding them off the board. And I think that that's what happened with, I mean, grass fed steak is a new thing. It's an ancient thing, but we had so much fast food, crappy food for so long that people, it took a while before people said, hey, you know what, I like the gristle. I like the bone. I like all the things in it that at one point people thought as being like bad. Oh uh, yeah, no, I, I hate cooking meat like uh, chicken without the bone, right? Like oh, when yeah. you grill it, you're just like, oh, this is terrible. Yeah, no. I love thighs. Absolutely, yeah, thigh, yeah. And, and like think of, I, <laughs> you know, we, we, like, we like beets. Only in meat. chickens am I not a breast man. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I, I really do think that we're, we're in a transitioning period. Like I love herb that hasn't been manicured. Like when I, for my personal head stash, I always, I might even leave it on the stem and put it in the, in, in storage because I know that, that it's been the least processed and I can pick it off and I can trim off those leaves and produce a bud that's just perfect. And I see the same thing with produce, you know, people will, will want to buy beets with the greens on them, even if they don't cook the greens, they'll cut the greens off and throw it away. But it just shows that that's a fresh beet that someone took a lot of care to handle. And I don't think we're there with cannabis yet, you know, because it's a new commodity. But eventually, if people want the best possible weed for themselves, they might have to, 
they might have to smoke something that doesn't taste the way they want, or they might have to, you know, get weed that's but, a little. But then you'll be able to eat a pill. Yeah. Fuck. No. Oh, right. So, 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 know, so right. just kind of some of what you guys are talking about, uh, Somnia Sativia Terra mentioned something that, that like lamb's breath, uh, I, I don't think it looks great. Right. But like, it's, it's great flower. And I think, you know, I, I know people who, uh, you know, grow ice cream cake and Mac for the market and then they smoke lamb's breath, right. Like for their own I honestly enjoyment. haven't seen lamb's breath in 20 years, like the real lamb's breath. That's another one that's like uh, Sonny Chiba. He definitely has uh, some lamb's bread crosses that definitely have lamb's bread. But I have yet, I think there was a, you know, not to change the subject too much, but there's a strain called Hassan that uh, Josh Silverback Freeman, uh, he created a long time ago. And uh, anyway, so uh the, the original lamb's bread got changed to Hassan in like Northern California. Uh, so they're calling it lamb's bread, but it was actually really Hassan. Now, if somebody has it, man, I'd love to friggin' uh, smoke it with them. Something I've been looking with for a long time to breed with. Yeah, for sure. And the original lamb's bread was, was wispy, not chunky, super. I mean, it was Jamaican style, man. It was, you know, Totally. Yeah, some of the best bud doesn't necessarily have the best structure. I think there's a lot of great strains that need to be worked more too. Right. Like, you know, that, that was the point I was. Best. That was the point I was making for the retail market. When people yeah. look at what it looks like, you know, it's like it's not very pretty. Yeah, I mean, my number one favorite is cat piss, and that's the ugliest bud I'd ever seen. You know, we'd pay for shreds in a bag, sixty dollars an eighth. You get a whole bunch of shreds. If you didn't know what you're looking at, it didn't really look like bud all the time. It just looked like you know, what, what you would pay, not even smalls, like even worse than that, but it got you so high and it tasted so good that you would pay $60 an eighth straight up <coughs> for an ounce. Totally. I love Grinspoon. Grinspoon is like yeah. awesome. I love these wispy El Dorado and, and Oaxacan varieties that like anyone in the market, they would laugh at it. They're just yeah. looking at it. It would sit on the shelf. No one would even touch it. But the, those who know, know that you can't get that effect any other way. You know, and yeah, we should develop varieties. We should take those genetics and turn them into more market-friendly varieties. But at the same time, we should also offer those varieties in their own. I mean, if you look at the wine, compared to the wine model, you know, people in California back in the day weren't willing to pay a hundred bucks for a 20-year-old bottle of wine because we had this Central Valley jug wine industry that, you know, we weren't trying to compete with French fine wine. And then when we started competing with French fine wine in the 70s and 80s and 90s, we started developing all the different incarnations of what wine could be, you know, from really sweet to really um, tannic and oaky and aged wine and dessert wine and all these different types that, that there wasn't a market for before. But once the connoisseurs came and they realized like, dude, I can't get this any other way, then the market evolved. And I think that we'll, we'll see that, that, that same evolution. And, and you know, new varieties will come. Ain't ones that have been historically proven, like sour diesel, will still maintain. You know, like they're sometimes you just get a lucky, a lucky pick, and the one seed that the dude pops becomes the thing that lasts for potentially ever. You know, I, I'm sure we're we're still eat, we're eating tomatoes and heirloom okay. varieties that. So, so on that point, a long time ago, Organic Pot said, what's the best thing to do when you find that unicorn? Grow it. Grow a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Grow it share it with Make your a lot of babies. Yeah, share call, it. With call me. Yeah. yeah call <laughs> well, there's, 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 uh, there's Dungeness Genetics and then uh, Doc and Yeti Farms in Washington that's uh, putting out uh, Swamp Thing and Hot Rod. And it's dead ringers for OG Kush. I mean, it, they work, it smells, it's the exact same thing. It's just, they're not shackling themselves to, you know, these names or this, like the past, but literally you open the container up and you're floored because the pieces are there and the stuff is there. So look up Dungeness Genetics, they're phenomenal product, man. Yeah, there's a ton of lines that need to be worked. I mean, Skittles, 
is amazing in its own right and it looks like shit it doesn't grow that well but i feel like the more it's worked you, you can work that turf profile into something that's amazing yeah so, swamp thing hot rod check it out that stuff is nice real good hot rod is that dungeon vault genetics yeah yeah i know eric pretty well he's a good dude uh, crushing it the stuff is yeah it's good times yeah yeah we do booths together in uh barcelona every year at stanvis yeah and all these gorilla glues too the gorilla glue has really come through as something consistent there's a uh, gorilla breath now there's like you know some other things out there where people are playing with it and it, it's it's true it, it comes through it delivers every time you know yeah you know gorilla glue was such a big game changer it's actually part of the sour story beyond it just you know having uh the genetics coming into it it Basically, uh, sour diesel, especially in Sonoma County with the friends in the circle that I had, they were growing tons and tons of sour for, for 12 years. And then all of a sudden comes Gorilla Glue, and they were able to get a similar price for Gorilla Glue. It finishes sooner, and it yields just as well, and it also has a better bud structure. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it cures out a little bit easier uh, for, for maintaining quality. Um, yeah, so dungeon, yeah, Gorilla yeah. Glue really was the evolution kind of in the in NorCal is at least a Sonoma and Mendocino that were pre predominantly sour growers so you don't see as much sour going around I mean there's some old timers uh, I got friends that grow it my friend Josh Freeman grows next level sour diesel he's another one we save the buds in jars and as we uh, need them we take them out of the freezer trim a little bit of the leaf off and it's ready to go Someone said a dungeon vault. No, I just want to get that them right. Dungeon vault genetics. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah. Dungeon vault. Yep. Eric from Dungeon Vault. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. It was like a it, it's a, a easier to process plant as well. You know, sour diesel yeah. can be a little bit tough to trim. Um, oh yeah. And if it's in the slightly wrong conditions, it'll get real larfy. It'll leaf out. You know, I I, I grew it in an octagon one time with some chems and uh Octagon systems are these vertical grows that have four tiers and there's 13 plants on each row and they grow towards a vertical light rather than a horizontal light. And uh, it turns out that the best strain for growing there was GDP because it takes so long to veg, it doesn't grow out. Whereas like sour and chem, they tend to double in flower. So I ended up with a wall of larf that just stretched out, you know, all around the garage. It was, we had four <laughs> octagons that were just all this, you know, larf walls. Larf <laughs> to continue the dead analogies. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, it's true, man. Well, that's a great talk, man. I'm really glad that we got to to riff on some sour diesel topics. It's been something that I've been wanting to do for a while. We've had this conversation in private many times. This is the first time we've had a kind of a public conversation here. And I hope that added some clarity to some people and didn't create any controversy because I don't think that there's any need for controversy and and it's just a simple story. So yeah, are, we ra are we wrapping on that? We're simple people. That's the strategy. That's right. <laughs> Keep it simple, stupid. Yeah, I'm good. I, if there's anything else, any other questions, I'm good. But otherwise, I feel like I got to say everything we wanted to say, and you know, but. Um, yeah, I think just, uh, I know James, there's a question. Uh, what uh, Edward Habits asked you, what about Karma and Short? They got some nice older selections, right? Question mark. Oh, yeah, definitely. Karma, Short, they got some old selections. Karma's done some really good work. I feel like he's really, uh, you know, put, put in the work. There's some breeders that they just breed F1s. Um, you know, and there's guys like Canarado that are super successful at making feminized, um, you know, F1s and that business model works and he uses really elite genetics. So that's why it works for him. But there's so many people that just cross this and this and they got F1 seeds and they don't do any work as far as selections, as far as, you know, they just want that new latest and greatest. And unless you have those super elite genetics, it doesn't really work. Whereas Karma has had the elite genetics and he's actually put the time in the uh, effort into working those into something that's special and amazing make it your own make it so, your own you know it's so by, it's by the way when's the book coming out the book is coming out uh well well i gotta talk to ed it's being published by ed's quick trading so we're looking at probably sometime after the first of the year okay
God damn. I, I, you've, been te- you've, been te- you've been teasing me for, I'm like, just send me like the rough draft PDF. Um, better, that's why. Keep adding yeah. good stuff to it. Right? Yeah, now with all this COVID stuff, it's like, man, yeah. nobody's going to want books anymore. They're just going to e-books. Why are, are you doing like a hard cut, like a, it's like only, a chemistry soft- textbook? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's seven pages. <laughs> <laughs> hard cover. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this narrow. <laughs> um, yeah, all right, I think we well, got like 30,000 words. It's 30,000 words, it's not seven pages, but. So, so just quickly, uh, if I can remember some of the stuff that was in my head, uh, tomorrow night, I think we're doing a, uh, another uh, fire fundraiser, um, which will, I kind of view them like YouTube telethons. Um, so James, if you want to donate anything, you can definitely yeah, step for sure. up putting you on the spot, but we'll, we'll no, talk no, about that let's offline. Talk later. I'm also, you know, I, if people have my email address is James loud genetics at gmail.com. If you had problems in the fire, you lost your farm, you lost plants from either fire or even retardant, or you weren't able to tend your plants and they died. Uh, I am donating seeds to farmers. So hit me up, send me some pictures. You know, we, uh, we're also offering free consulting. I work with a couple guys. So if you need consulting on how to get your farm back up, we're more than willing to help you out for free. So again, that's James loud genetics at gmail.com. Uh, yeah, I'm offering up to an acre worth of seeds for licenses too. So let me know. Yeah. And then, uh, so tomorrow night we're going to, so, so in the background, we're kind of building out a website and I'll bring, uh, Bam and uh, Adam, who's Santa Cruz Cannabis Co. on probably tomorrow night, just to kind of, we can give an update to everyone. But the concept was like the YouTube fundraisers were something that we could do immediately while the website takes a little bit longer to uh, build out. But, you know, the initial idea with the website is we, we don't, nobody involved wants to accept the money and then have to distribute it to someone in need because i mean there are a bunch of reasons like one is people calling you out and questioning whether like all the money went to the good cause and another one would be tax implications i have no idea so it was kind of like can we create a web platform where when someone get makes a donation 200 400 a thousand bucks whatever it is that it goes directly into the bank account of either a non profit or an individual, um, someone with health problems, someone who lost a farm. Uh, so anyway, that's what's going on in the background. Uh, some other random stuff, uh, for all the Boston people in the house, I talked to Glenn, big baby Davis yesterday, and we're going to do a, uh, I'm trying to get Robert Parrish as well. <laughs> Basically Celtics who smoked a lot of weed, uh, to talk about, um, you know, being on like road trips and smoking weed while you're playing in the NBA. Um, so anyway, it's smart, nice to see it auction. We're doing that. Uh, and uh, there's a bunch of other stuff coming down the pipe. By the way, if anyone, like I kind of pull these conversations together, but if anybody else wants to like throw out an idea and like, <laughs> moderate i have no problem with that uh i would love it actually um so anyone i think there are like almost 700 people watching right now but uh elka i'm looking at you dirty michigan Cordy, i'm looking at you uh jack greenstock i'm looking at you and a bunch of other people in the chat right now um but i don't have any pride of topics or moderation I see those shamrocks, fat rabbit. Uh, so anyway, so Mojave, James, Sour Silicate, I appreciate the time. Yeah, Bill Walton, I, I, should, I should reach out. That actually is good. I should reach out to Bill Walton. But uh, anyway, thank you, everyone. And, and we hopefully have some music coming up, too. One of my issues has been, like, when people DJ, I get all these, like, YouTube uh, copyright <laughs> dings. Um, so I was thinking like Mojave, for example, with his guitars in the background could serenade us and uh, yeah, James sure. Taylor style. 
Yeah. And uh, actually, we could get you and Ethan. Uh, you could you could be like uh, George Harrison and and John Lennon. Yeah. On the guitars. No problem. Uh, that, but that, uh, we, we need some we need too. some live musicians. Um, and then I have uh, I've been talking to some comedians about doing some comedy stuff. But uh, anyway, if people have ideas. If people want to lead something, just let me know. Uh, we'll probably be pressing some hash, uh, maybe tonight, maybe uh, Tuesday night. But uh, yeah, Cannabis Farms builds websites. Uh, so anyway, Mojave, thank you, and, and Sour Silica. That you, you guys, you're, you're. What I love is that you're very um, humble, and uh, you're not going to tell your own story. But uh, you know, Mojave was like, I know you love drama i don't love drama i just i i like getting to the truth and uh and, and giving credit to people who deserve it even if they're the tiniest person um i have no problem you know just writing wrongs i guess or uh just giving credit where credit's due so it's more that uh, than anything else. But uh, with that, we will kill the live stream. And I know everybody's waiting for the Patriots Seahawks game. So thanks for your platform. You Thank you. Thank you so no much. And, and, and I want actually, I want to have in the future, I want to have a glass conversation and Mojave can be your glass model because I want to talk, talk glass. Oh, yeah. We could show you some more. And um, I could, yeah, I can let you know more about the amazing artists that I was uh, really fortunate in my life to learn from to move on to this next stage in my life. Well, was that at Bob or was that someone else? Uh, I was fortunate enough to take a small class with Bob at the original Eugene Glass School. Uh, I took a class with Lewis Wilson. I've learned from uh, David Willis, Roger Paramore, Mark Lammy, Mark Ron, Jason Lee, um, Chris Carlson, um, Cesare Toflo, Matt Eskridge, HC. Recently, I finished a class during COVID with uh, BP Glass 94, uh, original Bob Apprentice. Um, and it's when I got around these people that my life really started changing. Um, you know, it's, it's never been easy. It's always been a struggle. Um, but in the end, uh, some really beautiful things have, uh, have turned out. And, and keep keep coming every day, you know. Well, Mojave, you're going to have to smoke out of his glass on behalf of everyone uh, as soon as we we wrap. I'll do that in about five minutes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll definitely see everyone tomorrow night, uh, if not randomly before then. Uh, so anyway. Excellent, Peter. With that, I'll kill the live stream. Great. Thanks for having me.